92.1 WROI, WROI FM.com. We are streaming audio live on RTC Channel 5, soon to be audio and video live on RTC Channel 4. Hi, Scott. Hello again, sir. Scott back in the studio, of course. And if you have a smartphone or an Android device, you can download a TuneIn radio app or something similar to that. Take us wherever you happen to be going. Well, we're pleased to welcome to the studio President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, Mr. John Alley. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All Always right. have fun coming down here. Ah, uh, good. Yes. Nice to have you with us. That's right. All right. Trustees met yesterday. Had a, a couple of items. Uh, you know, not a lot of stuff on the agenda. One very important item. We had our director of radiology come in and kind of discuss with the board our current CT scanner. And you know, it doesn't seem like it's been 10 years, but 10 years ago is when we put that uh, the CT in. And at that point, it was state-of-the-art leading technology for most of northern Indiana. The government has come out, and rightly so, starting to put some regulations in effect that says, how much radiation can we give a person? And uh, right now, as a critical access hospital, they said, you're exempt from this regulation, but other hospitals have to really reduce the amount of radiation that comes out of their CT scanners. So we got to look at this, and, and it was kind of interesting in his presentation that uh, some things I didn't know, that one CT scan is the equivalent of 100 chest x-rays. Wow. Well, that's a pretty big, it pretty is. Big, that's big, a big number. number. And, you know, radiation that you get through CTs and, and x-rays are cumulative. So that, you know, once you get that in there, it doesn't really go away. So we were looking at this and saying, okay, what's the right thing to do for our patients? And the new technology now, some of the new scanners, reduce the amount of radiation that you be exposed to during a CT scan by 85%. That's a big number. So even though we're not required by regulation at this time to you know upgrade at this time, at this time, key, it, it's going to come at some phrase, point. Sure. You know, we got a fairly good uh, uh, offer from uh, General Electric to say, hey, if you want to make a switch, we can kind of we have some incentives. So uh, you know, we we discussed it for a long time because it's a fairly large ca cash outlay. But you have to weigh not only the cash outlay, but what's the benefits to the patient? And you know, we just kept going back that 85% reduction in the exposure to the patient. So the board uh, did approve us yesterday to go ahead and move forward with the transition, replace our CT scanner. And then one of the good things about it, even though you're getting reduced radiation, the scan level is going to be comparable to what we're getting now. So you know, one of the things, unfortunately, the higher the dose, the clearer the image. Some of the new technology now, they have little scrubbers and stuff built into the, the software that can enhance that image. So we're going to get comparable image quality, much, much, much less radiation to the patient long term. That's just the right thing to do, and especially for folks that have maybe some sort of chronic disease where they're coming in three, four times a year for a CT scan, you know, that really starts building up over time. So it's just uh, you know, the right thing to do, even though we weren't required to do it. You know, the board uh, very proactive and says, you know, I think we need to move forward with this. So it could be several weeks as we do that transition. We have to get the order in, have to plan how we get the old machine out, the new one in. It'll probably be a mobile unit during that interim while we decommission one and bring the other one up to speed. But uh, you mentioned so GE, GE is the provider. GE is going to be the provider on okay. this one, yes. Okay. Uh, current uh, scanner is a Philips scanner. And, uh, you know, so when we get ready to do this stuff, we shop around and who has the best deals that's going to meet our needs and at this point GE was the the vendor that we did choose uh, to bring in their magnet and, or their CT scanner to help with this transition so very excited about that uh, you know just uh, again it's kind of eye-opening to a lot of folks when you start hearing some of the statistics on the amount of radiation you get in a CT scanner and unfortunately it is the you know scan of choice for physicians when they're trying to do their diagnosis because of the image quality that it gives so uh, you know, we're very excited about that, be able to re offer that now in, in Rochester. It's going to take us a while to get there, but sure. you know, the, the plan is moving forward very quickly and uh, just going to benefit the patients long term. Physicians, uh, Dr. Hayes was at the board meeting yesterday and highly recommended that we do this. Again, because of that radiation factor over time. And when you, you know, look at somebody maybe in their 20s and expected to live to their 80s or 90s, that could be a lot of radiation that they're being exposed to over their life. So, whatever we can do to reduce that. We need to do it, and uh, we'll be move, move forward with that. Excellent. Once we got done with that, which was a fairly lengthy discussion, uh, got into then what are the financials for the month of May? Uh, we had gross revenue for May of about 10.7 million, uh, wrote off 
6.7. So we're staying, you know, kind of bottomed out about that same percentage amount of write-off. So it left us uh, 4.9 million of operating revenue, had operating expenses of 4.3 million, so we actually had a net income of 674,000. Now that's jaded a little bit because three to four times a year we get a settlement from the state of Indiana saying, okay, we, we should have paid you this, we you know haven't, and uh, so they did give us a, it's called a, a, some DISH money or UPL money, however, you know, whatever the, the acronym is today. And uh, so we got some money there that helped bolster that bottom line. And we get that, like I say, two to three times a year, depends on how the state wants to make that distribution. Um, if we look just pure operations only without that money, probably would have had about a hundred thousand dollar loss for the month. Okay. But uh, you know, it kind of helps when they kick in and say, okay, let's try and make you whole for some of the past uh, shortages that they had given us. So we're glad we got that in. Help us have a positive month. How are we doing for the year? You, for the year on a uh, positive note again. Excellent. Again, we've gotten this will be our second um, check we've got from the state to help you know with some of the past. Some of it goes clear back to last year, so it's hard to say what's this year and what's that last year. But still in a positive bottom line so far year to date. We're kind of in that slow time right now, and uh, you know it'll start picking up then late September, October, then fall back off again in late November and most of the month of December. So. We kind of, you know, make hay while the sun shines. So sure. we're we're building up that bottom line because that's what we use, like the CT scanner. You know, we'll use the profits that we've generated to help fund that. And as we look, you know, move to the future, other equipment needs that we have. That's what the profits from the, the hospital. You know, they don't go to shareholders, they don't go out in bonuses. They stay within the organization, and we put it back into the infrastructure to help serve the community. Are there other things the hospital's going to need down the line? You know, as we look long term, yes. Um, you know, probably this year, not a whole lot. We've got most of our, what we'd call our emergent needs satisfied. Um, CT scanner was, it was kind of one of those opportunities that came that, do we do it now or do we wait till it's mandated? And, and this was a very good opportunity. So we probably pulled the trigger on that one a little sooner than what we'd anticipated. I, you know, we'd originally planned to put that into the 2017 budget probably do it third fourth quarter of next year some of the pricing and, and what we was able to get right now help you know move that up a little bit um, so yeah we kind of look when we do our budget we're getting ready to start that we do a three-year projection of what we think we're going to have to do as far as a capital uh, equipment or major repairs so the departments are starting that now starting to put together and say okay this machine's eight nine years old what's the anticipated useful life I'm going to put it in my budget. Now, just because it's in the budget, that doesn't mean that we go ahead and make that purchase. We like to make sure that when we do the purchase, it's needed. If the equipment's still good, still functioning, you know, why replace it? So we, we just kind of put it in the budget so we have an idea what we might be looking for. But there's nothing major that I can think of right now that's going to be coming the remainder of this year. I'm curious, uh, what does GE do with your old unit then? Uh, they will probably take it. Uh, it's actually our unit now is a Phillips unit. Oh, so, okay. okay. And they said they okay. would, you know, take that in on trade. Okay. Um, my best guess, they refurbish and put it on the market and resell it somewhere else. Lots of times, the equipment that a lot of hospitals will, you know, take out of service here, uh, they'll go overseas and you know they'll ship them, uh, you know, to a foreign country. And they're they're still good equipment, but you know, as we move forward here. Some other maybe countries not quite as affluent can benefit, can benefit sure. from this equipment so and that technology. So they, they have a global market for these, these pieces of equipment and they'll, uh, they'll market it somewhere, but they're okay. going to give us a fairly good trade-in value on that piece of equipment and then uh, move forward with the new one. Any other notes from the board meeting? That was pretty well it. Okay. Uh, like I say, it was, uh, we spent a lot of time discussing the CT scanner because it's a, it's a big investment for us. And, uh, you know, this year is kind of our cash crunch year as we're, you know, looking at funding some other projects, long-term projects. And so we've been putting money aside and we want to leave that there. We're not going to touch that. So we want to make sure that this wasn't going to cut us really, really short as we move toward year end. Uh, still fairly confident, you know, it's not going to be a big issue as we move to the end of the year. You know, once we get through this year, the way the monies are designated, some of these funds that we get in, like this state money, we have to hold through the end of our uh, fiscal year and then they're available for us to use at that point. So this money that we got in was, you know, was about $700,000. We can't touch until January 1 of next year. And to get that money, we have to put up one third of the funds and the federal government puts two thirds and they give it back to us. So it kind of starts taking some cash out of our immediate cash flow 
and we have to restrict it. So it's, you know, it's one of those kind of moving from pocket A to pocket B to pocket <laughs> C. Uh, but as we're trying to project this out through the end of the year, I think we're going to be fine. But we just have to make sure we restrict those funds, keep them segregated, don't use them for anything until we get through the end of this fiscal year. John Alley's president and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital brings us up to date on the Board of Trustees meeting yesterday and as well as other things affecting Woodlawn Hospital. The Affordable Care Act, are we still finding it beneficial in terms of your revenues? Yes. We did our budget last year. We put, you know, what we anticipated our bad debt was going to be in, in, uh, in our, what we call our compassionate care or charity care. Year to date, we're running substantially under budget. So we have seen an improvement in there. Now, it's, it's not a cure-all for everything. We still have a lot of folks that two years ago had zero insurance. Now they have insurance, but they still have that high deductible. So what's happening, we're getting some partial payment, but if, you know, until they meet their deductibles and co-pays, we're still, you know, not getting those funds. But as they move forward and we get later, later into the year, as they incur more bills, then they'll start getting to the point where insurance, there, what they have will kick in. But, you know, a lot of folks got a $7,500 deductible on their plan. That's a fairly high dollar amount that, you know, the first part of the year, they just don't have those funds. And so we see a little more write-offs early in the year than we do late in the year because at that point now they've kind of got past their deductible part and, uh, you know, go into where insurance starts paying some, you know, 80-20s or 70-30s on those plans. John, one of the other new things, or relatively new things at Woodlawn Hospital is the app or the portal. We were kind of talking about that before we went on the air. and. You might want to elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, it's uh, you know it's been around for a while, it, and it was part of the uh, government's plan they called meaningful use, where what they want to be able to do is you as a consumer, not have to call in or come in. You could go to our you know what they call is a portal, and you can access your medical record from home. So you can see what your lab results were, what your test, radiology, whatever. You can communicate with your provider through the uh, through the portal and make appointments and get feedback. And, uh, you know, we've been working on that, and, and uh, there's two separate ones. One's for the physician office and one for the hospital. And uh, it's kind of a neat little app, you know, for some of us who are more electronically challenged. It takes a <laughs> while uh, to get there. Everybody uh, but Scott. He's yeah, well, I, he's you know, when I have questions, I ask my, you know, five-year-old grandson, and he gets me right through it. Absolutely. Uh, but, it, you know, you can go online now, set up that portal, and you contact the hospital. We can give you your password to get you in that first time. But then that allows you to access all your medical records, all your information. So say you are on vacation and the doc says, uh, you know, you're, you're in Florida and had an accident. What meds are on? If you can't remember, you can go to the portal, bring it up, and it'll have all the meds you're on. It'll have test results. So if you've had some lab work done recently, that information is there. So now that other provider can go and look so they're not having to run all that stuff a second time. So it's a very useful portal that we have out there and some information. Uh, like I say, you can contact the hospital, they get you your password to get you into that system, and then just move forward and use it. And one of the fortunate or unfortunate parts is, you know, the government has said as a hospital, as physician providers, you have to ensure people do this. And so they're, they tie our reimbursement okay. to how much access we have. And it started off, we needed to have, you know, 50% participation. Now it's moved to 70, and it's going to eventually move to 80, 85% of correspondence between you and your provider in the hospital must be through this electronic means. So, you know, we're, you're going to see more and more uh, hospitals and physician practices saying, please use our portal. And I, you know, if you've gone to even your dentist and stuff here lately, they're going to say, we now have a portal, you can access your information. They really want you to do that because, you know, to be honest, part of their reimbursement, how they get paid, is based on how much activity they have through these portals. And it's probably good for you as the patient, it's too. It's good for you because you you got that information right there. And if you're like me, you go see your doctor and they give you all your test results. By the time you drive home, you go, I wonder what they said. You can go back onto the portal and it's all right there. And you can look at it and it has a little you know, information bar. So if you have a question, you can click on that. And it comes up and says, okay, you had a you know, an XYZ test and it was 7.3, normal range is 6.2 to, you know, here. Am I normal? Am I high? Am I low? It's really a lot of information out there. And it, you know, it just kind of prevents you maybe making a call to the doctor and get put on hold for 15 minutes while they're trying to track the doctor down to answer your question. You get on the portal, check your medical record, see what's going on, and then if you still have questions, call in. But it gives you some of that preliminary stuff early on that may maybe answer 80% of your questions without having to try to sit on the phone and wait for the physician. Okay, how do I get it again? 
contact uh, you know you can call in and contact your provider so, okay you know wh whoever your doctor is call them and they can get you that information how to get into the portal okay and uh, they can even get you the hospital side of it also so it uh, you know once you get it set up it's fairly easy and like I say even for us electronic, just like another app right? just like another app sure. and like us electronic channels information a person like myself even I can do it so okay. if I can anybody can John, last question today, but I, I'm always curious as to Woodlawn and doctors, and are we up to staff, or are we where we, we want to be? We're, we're still looking at, you know, unfortunately, I know I've got some physicians probably the next three to five years are probably going to be thinking about retirement, uh, and that yeah, sounds like a long time, but when you're trying to do physician recruiting, three to five years is not that far out. So we've actually started now doing some uh, visits to some of the medical schools, talking to some of the second year and third year residents, you know, are you interested in rural health? So constantly looking for some folks, uh, you know, we do have- a, Some are, some aren't? Some are not wanting rural medicine. Okay. Uh, when you talk to them, you know, and some, I hate to say it, but they don't like to do family practice medicine. Uh, you know, and you talk to them, well, your dad's a family practice or your uncle or your mom. Yes, and I see what, you know, they were on call all the time. Uh, they all want to be some sort of ologist. You know, they they work four days a week, you know, eight hours a day, no call, no weekends, no holidays, and they make twice the money because they've specialized. So we're seeing a, a vast amount of these young docs now coming out, going into some sort of specialty, not really looking to family practice. So it's getting harder and harder to find that person who, one, wants to do family practice, and two, do it, unfortunately, I have to say, we are a rural sure. setting, and, uh, you know, they want to be in the big city. So it, it's a challenge to find that individual. And they have to have that passion. They want to be in rural health. They want to do family practice. And uh, it's highly competitive. Are there recruiting firms out there to help you? There are recruiting firms that do that. And, uh, you know, some do what we just call kind of the shotgun effect. They just send a letter to everybody in the country right. and hope they get a response. Some others are more focused. So we kind of use a little mixture of both where if we have one particular th type of physician we'll look for, we'll go to a recruiter who specializes in that and say, here's what we're looking for. And they do a lot of that legwork. They'll actually interview the, the physician. Are you interested in a rural setting? Are you, in, you know, do you have family ties in northern Indiana? And it uh, saves us a lot of time. You know, we have to pay for that. But again, it, from the money and time spent, sometimes that's the most beneficial way to do it, that they know what physicians are looking for a rural setting. They just target those. Or they know physicians got family, say, in northern Indiana, and they'll say, would you like to get back close to home? And then they sell the hospital for us. So it, uh, it's a never-ending job, and it's, it's getting more and more difficult, especially for family practice. Sure. Uh, you know, I have so much respect for our docs who do family practice now because they're the unsung heroes. I mean, they're on call all the time. You know, it's hard for them to, to get away from it. And, uh, you know, they, they spend a lot of time in, in treating their patients. They do it really, really well, and I, I do respect what they do. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodland Hospital. Have we pretty well covered it? I think we've got it. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for the great things Woodland Hospital does for our community. Well, it's not me. It's the staff. Okay. I, I give the direction, and they, they make it happen. They make me look very, very good, and a great bunch of people to work with out there. Thanks again. Thank you.